you know what I'll be talking about when we get to the front. This is more machine shop equipment here. Back behind the yellow is our welding area, at least one of them. Um, you will also see our sandblaster right over here. The EPA does not like us to sandblast. They prefer that we use baking soda. Sometimes, however, we still must resort to sandblasting. Baking soda is a mixed blessing. It gets, it's friendlier to what you're removing, you know, you're scouring to get the corrosion off, but it also leaves more of the corrosion behind and requires more handwork to finish up. Um, corrosion is the biggest problem that this facility has. You must remove it all from anything that you're restoring because it will grow back as a cancer. So we sandblast both with um, machinery, you know, equipment like this and with handheld blasters. We baking soda blast in the same way. In fact, we do that more than the sandblasting. We uh, hand rub. We use glass beads or walnut shells to tumble very fragile items through to get rid of the corrosion. Whatever it takes to get rid of it, whatever. Um, over here you see drop tanks that will eventually go on our F-82 over in the main museum, the uh, Queen Mustang. That plane that you see on the floor of our museum is the one nicknamed Betty Jo, and if you just count Voyager, she still holds the record for a prompt aircraft distance-wise. Non-stop Hawaii to New York, which is 7,000 miles. And to make that trip, we had four of these tanks. The problem is, is that the pylons we have aren't quite right, so we're going to have to make some adjustments. <laughs> Are you? I, this will get you back and forth to work. <laughs> oh, actually, it was a twin engine jet. <laughs> the, um, this is what is generally referred to still in the museum as the volunteer restoration area. Uh, someone asked me who is doing the work. There are both paid uh, employees and volunteers who work in this facility. Um, Paid, volunteer, paid employees and volunteers, however, do not work together usually in the same teams. Not because of any you know, animosity or anything like that. It's just that paid employees have to work a 40-hour week and volunteers don't. And teams have to be able to work roughly the same schedule. The original division of labor was that if it was an engine system or a weapon system, it would be restored by volunteers and aircraft would be restored by uh, paid employees. Uh, the has, the role of the volunteer has grown and changed over the last few years. Engines and weapon systems are still most likely to be volunteers. But volunteers also do aircraft. Most of the projects in here are in fact volunteer restoration projects. Uh, when volunteers do a restoration job, they are under supervision of a museum employee, somebody is overseeing the work. However, you cannot volunteer here unless you are already skilled labor. You have to know what you're doing with you. Now, what you are looking at here are the remaining two XH-26s in the world. This one's ours and that one's Fort Rutgers, and they loaned it to us so we can copy parts. The XH-26 started out in 1950, early 50s, I think 1953, as an observation vehicle which could be hauled to the front, put together, and then flown over enemy territory. That was the Army. The Air Force was then interested in it as a possible means of dropping the parts to a downed pilot and letting him assemble it and extract himself, so I'm not entirely sure how he would do that. Um, the thing was designed to be carried in a 6x6x14 uh, six by six by foot trailer behind a regular Jeep. It could be put together with no more tools than needed to repair, to put, you know, to repair a Jeep. It could be put together with no more skills than necessary to repair a Jeep. And its useful load was 300 pounds plus fuel, and that was, of course, the man and the, um, the controls and the, the instruments. The controls were very, very simple because theoretically anybody had to know how to be able to fly this thing. Um, now, it folds up. You pull pins and you could just collapse the whole thing down. Now, the canopies all could be popped out. The door canopies are bubbled, so it's a little roomier than it actually looks. Um, the, the doors can either be removed or just simply opened and folded down. And you can see how this folds down. It's going to match up against that. Uh, the tail section pops off and it all fits in the trailer. And you can haul it around. There are two types of landing gear available to you. These both have tricycle gear, but there was also skid gear. 
uh, for it. In the end, neither service decided to buy this thing. Uh, some of you were saying, laughing about, you know, get you to, to and from work. Every time I see this, it makes me think of the old Disney shows where the world of the future, <laughs> you know, all the stuff we were going to have. <laughs> yeah, did mention the fact that a little on the loud side. Yeah. Um, two ramjets, which is the simplest of all engines, and those were on the end of each of the rotor blades, so there was no torque problem. The ramjet is simply a tube with a valve and a combustion chamber. Fuel and oxygen combine in the combustion chamber, the valve closes and the air is blown out the back. The valve opens, combustion flows out the back. This happens between 50 and 250 times a second. The most famous ramjet was, is in fact still the V1 rocket that the Germans used during World War II. And if you think that technology is dead today, no it's not, because the labs here at Wright-Patterson have been working on the last few years on a pulse detonation engine, which is very similar to this. And their pulse detonation engine, sitting, they use, uh, what is it, a light easy, is that the proper name? A little small airplane that looks like an air, you know, airframe, but with nothing with skin. Um, they've had it on the, the engine on the ground. It's where they've had the engine continuously run for more than eight hours. They've kept that little plane in the air for 45 minutes with it. And last November, they put notices out to the local you know, news media that not to be alarmed at the awful noise coming from our field out here where they were testing the engine. <laughs> so this technology is still with us. Um, the mechanisms from Fort Rucker, and then these are the last two we'll be making parts for it. This is a slightly earlier model than this one. There were only about probably 12 of these built. Now, I'm one of the two guys that's responsible for getting no, you know, information on this thing. And when the museum acquires something, their research package isn't necessarily complete. So, oh yeah, somebody will tell us, well, if you flew this fast and carried this many people, but they'll tell you the fun stuff. So, Mark and I have to go find that out so we can give it to one of us and the guys. Well, this was kind of hard to find information on because it was such a, a you know, program that, didn't, program that didn't go anywhere. Someone said, oh, well, Fort Rucker has one, so I went to the Fort Rucker website. Well, yeah, they have one, but they don't want to tell you about it. So I went to Google, and this was my first, we had only had our computer a few weeks, this was my first internet search. <laughs> so I just typed in, you know, American XH-26. I also tried the American helicopter site. I didn't have anything either. And I got information. It was a place that had info. I started reading it. I had enough information already to know what I was reading was accurate. Read it, got to the bottom, and it was a Russian website. <laughs> this is a right um, R1820, uh, and if you don't know how to read an aircraft engine number, the R stands for radial, which means that all the cylinders radiate out from the center. And the 1820 is 1,820 cubic inches of engine space. <laughs> um, this Wright engine is one that was used in bunches and bunches and bunches of airplanes, uh, particularly during World War II. Uh, if you look at the power plants of the planes that took part in the Battle of Midway, you will see that almost all of them, American and Japanese, have some variant of the Wright aircraft engine in it. Uh, there was a great deal of uh, legal technology transfer going on between um, the United States, Great Britain, and Japan in the 1930s, and they, the Japanese had every right. Uh, that sounds bad, every right to build right engines, but <laughs> uh, but they did so. And in fact, the Zero has a variant of this engine in it. Um, okay, but sitting back over here is a mock-up of an Agena uh, booster engine. The Agena was a uh, space probe that could attach to the Thor missile, and you'll see the parts of the Thor when we get into the other part. But that's made of fiberglass. Most of that's fiberglass and metal bits. So that's just a mock-up and the little plate that covers it right here. But we'll talk about the aircraft in the back because the part I really want you to see is back in the back.
They hold that job until 1978. Somewhere in that time, Frankie started teaching at the University of Dayton. Um, he retired from federal service in 78. He started wintering in Florida, so in the winter he taught at a select, you know, certain Florida universities, and in the summer he taught at the University of Dayton. And he did that until almost right until he died, which is about four years ago. Um, he didn't, he was always obsessed with speed, and he did not live to see his main goal achieved, which was to see a truly reusable space plane, something that could come and go at will using a regular runway and not a lot of prep time. And the reason that we needed to have this vehicle is there was some poor guy in New York whose girlfriend lives in Tokyo, and he needed to see her in half an hour. Mm -hmm. That's why he said we needed this. Um, one of the things about the Heinkel engine is that pertains to World War II is during World War II, all Heinkel engines were built by slave labor. This is an RF-84K back here. But the reason I had you look at the hook and the plate for it is this did not start out like as an RF-84K. This started out as a FICON stands for fighter conveyor. And this was one of the two parasites developed for the B-36. The B-36 was the world's first intercontinental bomber. This was pre-air-to-air -air refueling. So you had to be able to carry your own um, fighter support with you. So we developed two parasites, the XF-85 Goblin, little tiny unstable jet, unsuccessful. The FICOM was a successful aircraft. Um, this was designed to carry by the hook that I showed you on the front under the bomb bay of the B-36. But fly its mission, if, the, if it had to detach from the aircraft, it would simply drop off of its uh, support, fly its mission, and then come back to the aircraft and, and rehook. And it could do that. But if it wasn't able to rehook, this one could land. It had still had its gear. The XF-85 Goblin had no gear, was its big problem. Um, but as soon as we developed air-to-air -air refueling, fighter, fighters as defenders became obsolete overnight. And the FICONs were immediately transferred to the RF-84K role. Um, which had some airplanes already that were not FICONs. Um, now, you can tell if you're looking at a picture of a plane enabled an RF-84K whether it started out as a FICON. If you have a really good eye, you can see the two little plates that closed out because the hook folds into the airplane. You see the two little plates. But the dead giveaway is the tail. On the FICONs, the tail is an inverted V. So it can clear the bottom of the V-36. That is not the standard tail for an F-84. Um, so that's how you can, that's the dead giveaway. Uh, this one here is, um, we're getting ready, well, it's, on, it's, it's a volunteer project. It's kind of, it's not exactly on hold because you can see that they're, every time, time we come in here, seeing that they're doing more work. But their next big project is to insert the engine and then connect the airplane. And that's been listed as wintertime work. And so they won't get to this till probably next fall. Uh, but the plane had some severe hail damage that we had to have fixed. We had to have this, you know, uh, pro professionally scoured because some of it was so bad. But it had some things that had to be done to it. But it's actually coming along pretty well. It started life as a torpedo bomber designed by the British in the late 1930s. But our interest in it is because the Bristol Bow Fighters would become the world's first night fighters. Not the first planes designed to be a night fighter. That's the Black Widow, but the first plane to be equipped with radar. At the beginning of the war, radar was a crude system of towers which would let you know something had entered your airspace. Proper use of that information now made it a really, really successful tool, but it could not go in an airplane. Uh, radar would then start to become the fastest, would become the fastest, still today, fastest technological development of anything in history, and start with the British. Uh, they would realize that they couldn't work fast enough at home. So the whole project was picked up and moved to MIT and became a joint U.S.-British project. And very, very quickly, radar went from huge and crude to small enough and neat enough. Neat enough to fit inside an airplane. Now you can night fight. You have eyes at night, eyes in the sky. So the next thing the British did was to look at their existing inventory and find an aircraft large enough to take radar and, and operator. And they chose the Bristol Bow Fighters. That's how it came from the Fighters. The United States would use these, but the Air Force would fly them starting in North Africa and then working its way up into Northern Europe. I believe this will be painted as a U.S. one. Uh, probably a fifth Air Force one. Uh, this one was originally a Mark I, and the Mark I's would be redesignated Mark Sixes. This one has a lot of Mark I parts in it that were uh, upgrade packages that came out for this. 
Uh, but a lot of this one is still more Mark I than Mark VI. This was also um, one of the first groups to be sent to Australia. And we have this served with the Royal Australian Air Force quite honorably in World War II. Um, most, a lot of the restoration work was actually done in Australia. They were restoring a World War I battle wreck to airworthy conditions to try to get it so they could fly it. We in our collection had a bow fighter fuselage still in a crate, okay? And this is perfect for flying. Um, so we offered a deal. They restored what they had. They would get our, our zero time fuselage. What they had is the fuselage to just the outside of the engines, all right? Just to that outside there. And the gear, all of that was theirs. First thing they restored was the cockpit, and that was on display for several years in our museum while we acquired the rest of the pieces. Beautifully, beautifully done. Uh, we restored the wings, or had them restored for us. A lot of the work was done at Lowry Air Force Base when it still was, because they had a wings pad on the spot shop there. They did that. Uh, the engines were restored right here for this. Now, the engines are kind of interesting. They're the uh, Bristol Hercules sleeve valve engines. They're unusual in two reasons. One, that the same company that designed the airplane also designed the engine, very odd. And the fact that it's a sleeve valve engine, which is also an odd engine in its own right. Um, the, you can see the sleeve in here and the pistons ride on that rather than the other way around. It's a very, very quiet engine. The Japanese nicknamed it Whispering Death. The thing about this is it does not require another cooling system for it. Um, We had only one authentic Bristol uh, bow fighter region, and it was all yellow and raised. So we had to make our own. Down in the exhibits division, we have a very large heat shrink vacuum, a heat shrink vacuum machine. So what we did with this is we put the finished mold, and that was a piece of equipment this mold had to be compatible with. We put the mold in there, we put the sheet of filling over the top, turned on the heat, and the plastic break its way around the plastic, and then we turned on the vacuum, sucked out all the air, making the force fit to the mold and then you trimmed off the extra plastic. And we didn't just make it good. We made that hot because when the equipment is up and working, you want to make your spares because things happen. So we made several. <laughs> One of the things that just arrived was the engine cowling. We've been waiting two years to find the engine cowling for this. And one of the things you notice is that it's held on by metal struts. You have to stay here, but I'm going to go over there and show you. Uh, one of the parts on this that is Mark one, a, one rather than Mark VI is the flat tail. Um, the Mark VI has actually had a dihedral tail to give it stability at slow speed. So, Okay, Rose and I are going to get the same airplane at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, an Avro CF-100 Canadian aircraft. And you may say, why do we have a Canadian airplane in here? Why are we restoring it? Well, the mission of our museum uh, was is to use the things, I think your group has gone that way. <laughs> yeah, excuse me, please move. Uh, is to um, preserve, to um, well, essentially one of everything the United States Air Force so its predecessors have used. Um, we also include any aircraft that have been flown against us or designed in the case of a lot of Russian things to be flown against us. But when we started to tell, knew we were going to start telling the story of the Cold War, and operations since then, we needed to start including Allied aircraft and coalition airplanes. And if you're going to tell the Cold War story, you have to have the CF-100 Chinook. Because in the 1960s, this was the principal defender of the dew line, the radar line across the Arctic Circle, to protect us from planes coming across the, uh, the North Pole from Russia. Um, that mission belonged to the Canadians. Uh, the CF-100 Chinook is also the only Canadian designed and produced aircraft to see wider NATO service. And only that is what Belgium bought it. It's still a great airplane, actually. Um, the United States 
because we have never flown this airplane if it's part of our Air Force. However, U.S. Air Force pilots have flown it because of the exchange program that exists between the RCIF and the United States Air Force. Their guys fly with us and we, uh, we fly with them. And in that capacity, American pilots did fly the B-1 and the CF-100 pumps. Um, right now, they're getting ready to put in the engine. All the, I mentioned all the parts that are lying around here belong to this. They uh, just finished uh, painting the insides of the um, and the plane will be very nearly done. But we have come up against what seems like a minor hangout on a big wheel seat. They believe the Canadian Air Force uses today is very stylized. When this plane flew, it had the stair rated edges. And the Canadians are trying to find us a template to get the right maple leaf on there. If we can't get the right template, then we will have to hand paint it on. <laughs> That's become a major, a major block on this airplane at the moment. From the other side, and we may actually go into the little room over there before I do it. Okay, once again, please watch out. We have to leave you have to walk through the door. Original architects cut away the model of the museum in there, and I like to talk about how you load a building and all that stuff. But we'll just have to do without it today. Um, what you're looking at over here is the XP75A. This was, and it was a plane designed by a committee, as a matter of fact. And it was an attempt at a long-range fighter for World War II. We were constantly looking to pursue a design like that for the Pacific, and didn't actually produce one. Um, with the XP-75A, instead of designing the plane from scratch, they decided to take the best from all the fighters we have and combine them all, all, all into one airplane and got a horrible aircraft. The first design was the XP-75. Really, really bad. It was redesigned into the XP-75A, just as bad. In fact, the test pilot to this general, Bradley Eckery Fluid, said to the Air Force, don't buy it. Uh, yeah, well, it's not worth it. Um, part of the... Oh well, yeah, I'm going to get to all of that. Part of the problem with this is what they wanted out of it. They wanted twin engine capability and a one engine configured airplane. And in order to get an engine of the size that could do this, they needed, they used the Allison 3420, which is two 1710s men together. The 1710 is a V engine. You have a V here, you have a V here. And the only place that fits is back behind the pilot. So you have the heaviest thing in the aircraft toward the back of the airport plane, which puts the center of gravity at a very, very bad place. The, from the engine to the nose, there is a double drivetrain that runs through the belly of the aircraft to power the two propellers. Now, drivetrains don't run smoothly. They're always doing this. So you have this shimmy thing going on in the middle of the airplane as well. Now, it's actually an interesting engine to look at. If you've been down to the research and development hangar, there's one of these restored against the wall. And you see how, how this goes. You have the engine, the double drive train. When you get up to the front, we can see the gearbox. Because one half of that engine is powering one propeller, and one half is powering the other propeller. And the two shafts have to come together to power what is, in fact, a sleeved prop um, there. The, the outer part of the sleeve is for the back prop and the inner part is from the front prop. And those are contra-rotating props, one's going one way and one's going the other. And that was to get rid of the torque problem. Now, the other problem with this engine is, is the gun requirement. All right, each wing has three 50 caliber machine guns. No big deal, fairly standard. But the requirement for this plane was 10 guns. The other four guns are on the nose. You see those bubbles? There's two on each side. There were four more machine guns, and those had to fire out, or would have had to fire out, between the contra-rotating props. It was said it would have taken a watchmaker to synchronize that. Now, <laughs> now this one, look, it, this was on display down in R&D or presidential, I forget which, for many, many years. And if you looked at it, you would have said, oh, geez, I'll never get this fixed up. But in truth, it wasn't in terrible condition. The metal was, you know, it up, but it wasn't terribly corroded. So polishing is the biggest thing we've had to do with this. Now we have not 
as we would normally do taking the engine out and we stored it with this. Because in order to get the engine out of here, you have to take the airplane apart. And the rest of the airplane didn't warrant that. So, but this is coming along quite nicely. Um, so like maintenance requirement. Right until 1996. This was a super secret <coughs> project. And it started out during the Korean War when our principal recon aircraft were RB-17, something I can't even comprehend, and RF-80s. And they were mincemeat as far as the mix were concerned. And our guy said, we have to have capabilities in a recon plane the same as that of the F-86. And the Air Force said, okay. And gave him permission to modify in the field two F-86s into the first two RF-86s. And this was Project Honey Bucket. What they did is they mounted a World War II vintage camera in the belly of the airplane back behind the pilot. Now, it could not mount so that it was firing straight down. It had to be mounted in horizontal, which means that it had to fire off of a 45 degree slant in the um, Put all of this in there, it required that they take out the gun sight and the lower uh, pair of guns. They took the two configured aircraft, they went out, flew some missions, came back, and developed the film. It was very shaky and not terribly clear, but they could see the actual promise of the design. So the Air Force gave them permission now to modify in the field 20 more F-86s into the R models, and that would be Project Ashcan. Now, whenever you're talking an in-field modification, you are talking um, everything different. <laughs> Uh, the camera that was mounted in there was still had to be mounted horizontally, but it was a much more stable camera, so the pictures were good. The film canister was big enough, at least for some of the aircraft, they took out the next set of guns, and you also get the first bulge on the airplane, uh, that's become characteristic of the F-86s. This project was so successful that the Air Force, toward the end of the Korean War, decided to configure from scratch our F-86s, and that would be Project Haymaker. Now with the Haymaker aircraft, you now have a camera firing out the bottom of the airplane with no more mirrors. The film canister, however, was so large that it put a bulge on both sides of the airplane, getting the plane nicknamed May West. Um, the, this one does not have its guns on it, though there is some indication that some of the Haymaker airplanes still had a top set of guns. In any case, any guns left in the RF-86s were still operational. However, they had no gun sights. Those were all gone. Um, the, they were generally painted in regular squadron colors and would generally fly with other F-86s uh, to give them some protection. Um, the planes may or may not, we're taking the position that they did serve at the very end of the um, Korean War, but that's a bit iffy. They started flying them in 1950, you know, summer of 53, of course the war ended then. Um, the planes would be built by the United States Japan and Taiwan and be used by those three countries as well as South Korea. We all use them. And all the company countries kept this plane secret until 1996. The planes were so secret even in their own use days that even the commander could not question the pilots on their mission, which of course allowed for some shenanigans because if you really wanted to be up to something, all you had to do was say mission and you were home free uh, because you knew you couldn't be questioned. These planes would do deep penetration flights over the Soviet Union and would have extra gas tanks to do that. Uh, up to four extra tanks to make that type of mission. Um, men would be shot down flying these, would be lost. Some of the 168 MIAs of the Cold War were RF-86 pilots. And their mission is just as the same as with the RB-57, that their mission would be taken over by the U-2 uh, when it came online mid to late So they're very incredible. Incredible airplane, actually. Uh, this one is a complete uh, volunteer restoration. Most of the men working on this uh, had worked for the Springfield Guard Unit and had expertise <laughs> on F-86s. And the average age of the team working on this volunteer team was about 80. That's the mm. average age. The um, Nostrum warhead for uh, the Titan II that has a 15 megaton weapon, would have had a 15 megaton weapon. Titan II will be going on display as soon as the next row, as soon as we get the stand on Titan II right here. We'll actually talk about the missiles in general and all that kind of stuff a little bit later, but most of what I'm going to talk about here is the back here. Um, see here the, uh, one of the uh, horizontal stabilizers. And a lot of this has had to be replaced, be rebuilt, and I'll explain why in a second. 
plane you're looking at is Japanese aircraft that the Allies called George. Uh, the Japanese were responsible for a number of significant engineering achievements during World War II, the Zero actually being one that usually leads the list. Because the plane was designed to be easily built, easily flown, and its principal purpose was to shoot down Allied airplanes. I think it did very well. It was also a throwaway aircraft. It had no armor plating. But at the beginning of the war, the Japanese didn't have to worry about that. But as the war went on, they needed sturdy lasts forever. So you get another significant engineering achievement. You get George. <laughs> Uh, plane designed to last. It was also designed to meet the threat of the B-29. However, as soon as we got a look at it, uh, we tooled the engines of the B-29. It generally could screws higher than this could reach. And at that time, we were by the time these were under construction, we were also making great inroads into bombing of Japanese war industries and the George Target uh, factories were targets. In the end, only 1,300 of these would be built. But it's still a very significant aircraft. Um, the flaps on this aircraft control themselves. They are not their combat flaps. So actually you're, what you're looking at seeing is a fly-by-wire element in 1943 in an airplane. Uh, there was a vial of mercury back behind the pilot and when the uh, as he was shift moving the aircraft, the mercury shifted in the vial and it gave a signal to the flaps and that's how they operated. So we would expect that today, but this was 1943. Now, um, this one started out, talking about, we were just telling you about restoration schedules out there. This one started out as a volunteer project to fix up the cockpit. Estimated time, nine months. Well then, oh gee, the engine could use a little work. So that at a time, and I'll talk about the engine in a little, a little bit. And then they got a look at the aircraft and realized it was much more corroded inside than they expected. We originally thought we could sandblast, hand sandblast out, but that wasn't going to work, so the plane had to be taken apart. Nine months has now turned into nine years. Now, part of that is because the plane has been on stall, especially in the last few years, while we get stuff ready to, to move in. We get, have gotten stuff ready for the Cold War and things like that. Um, it's being worked on little bit by little bit, and we'll probably step up on the schedule very soon. But it's been nine years instead of nine months uh, for this airplane. Now, part of the problem was that I don't know if there's any pieces of corrosion. Usually, there's one I can show you. Let's go down on the other side of the giant doorway. Some of the, this is some of the least of the corrosion, actually. There were parts of the metal inside the, the tail where the aluminum corroded so badly that a piece of, you know, micro-thin aluminum had turned into, like, you know, expanded out to more than an inch. And all of that had to be cut out. And the reason for the horrible corrosion in George is the fact that, like most aircraft, its parts are aluminum, but the Japanese only had steel rivets. So everywhere you had steel against the aluminum, you started up a you know, uh, electrolysis process. Um, what you see in here are some of the photographs of, of the aircraft as it was looked when it, before we started disassembling it and of the disassembly process. We become part of the history of an aircraft when we restore it. So we document everything we do, and we document by photograph as well as written reports. The photographs are a very valuable tool. Even if you have blueprints, pictures are worth the world in getting the thing back together. And we don't have the blueprints for this. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> uh, the photographs will help us make sure that we have it back the way it's supposed to be. Um, the um, engine which started out as a minor restoration project, actually uh, had, we decided to completely redo the engine. Now in this case, this aircraft, by the way, was acquired by uh, um, the ASME, no, the, excuse me, the Air Force Association from San Diego. And the engine had been pickled, which meant, essentially means it had been packed in preserving oils so that it didn't corrode. Uh, but we took the whole engine apart, cleaned it up, put it back together, uh, and theoretically this engine would still be usable. Uh, for this aircraft. That's not always so when we restore an engine. Very often when you restore an engine, you still don't get something that'll work. Some parts are too frozen together to be separated, plus you have the problem of missing parts. If a part is missing and you can't find the proper thing, then you fake it with fiberglass. Looks great, but it doesn't work. And old spark plugs are a big problem. If you can't get the proper type of spark plug and it's gonna show or support something, you have to have something in that space. So we take a tube and run it through a lathe and make a spark plug. Looks good, but <laughs> is it going to work? <laughs> so they're not always wonderful. But in this case, this engine is supposed to be. Now, this is the naming of the aircraft. The Japanese, of course, did not fall short. 
this is their name, Fadu Kai, and that translates out to violet lightning. They named their, their fighters after the weather phenomenon, and violet lightning is a weather phenomenon. blasting equipment back there. In the far corner is our paint booth, and that actually is bigger than it looks. You can actually get an aircraft of some size in there. Um, it is, um, has a water wall that operates on the back. If you are spray painting in there, you must operate the water to control particulate matter. The EPA monitors very carefully what this facility does. There are things that we are allowed as a private citizen to put on our, buy, you know, buy the gallon from the home repair store and put on our houses on a 90 degree day and be in violation of no laws. Some of those same things we can't have and other things that we can just use at home legally, this facility cannot, if you want, or if we can use them, you have to take the jar, even if you want just one paintbrush full of something, you have to take the, the can, weigh it down to multiple decimal places, use what you're going to use, and then re-weigh it and mark how much you use. We have to do all of that kind of stuff uh, in here. Um, sometimes the rules can be kind of, you know, like, you know, when you have to use 35 coats of one paint when two of another one worked, you know, <laughs> things like that. But we have to abide by the law, so. You said something that kind of flexes the core of something I heard before. You said you're controlled by the Air Force. Yes. I heard that the federal government does not support this facility. Um, okay, I can just explain how the funding works. The buildings and the entire collection belong to the United States Air Force. They do not, the federal government does not buy us anything, all right? They pay the salaries of the civil servants. They pay the power bill. They provide the security. But they do not buy us anything. An independent organization, the United States Air Force Museum Foundation, raises money to buy us stuff like new buildings, uh, if we need, need things, um, parts for airplanes, things like that. That's how that's done. So every time you shop at the gift shop, go to the IMAX, eat the cafe or race your quarters, you are contributing to the foundation. <laughs> and that'll be them. That's how it's that's the thing is, yeah. So but yeah, title for everything belongs to the United States Okay. Have any idea what the budget is for this year? Have no idea. And that, that information is actually not we've not made we're not supposed to discuss that. Alright, this is the X thirteen Vertijet. This is just how, down here in storage and probably Sometime this summer, maybe not until next fall, this will move down into the research and development hangar. The X-13 is another very bizarre project. This was designed to be hauled to a specific location on a trailer, and by the way, we have the trailer. The trailer would then be brought to vertical with the jet on it, and then the jet would take off, sliding up the trailer. When it cleared the trailer, it would turn to horizontal flight, fly its mission, when the mission was over, it would come back to the trailer using this hook as a landing gear, snagging a cable and coming back down like this onto the trailer, and the trailer would go back down to horizontal and drive off. This all worked. It all successfully tested. But the Air Force also decided, thankfully, not to buy it. There was a prop version of this called the Pogo. Also, they also worked with us, uh, both the Air Force and the Navy tested that, though that's a little more associated with the Navy than the Air Force. But. One of those? Yeah. 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 Well, Harrier Jet is, uh, and in fact, the X-35 or uh, the F-35, the Marine Corps version, will also have the ability to lift itself off the ground. So. Oh, the Harriers? Yeah. Uh, well, my son-in-law just got moved to the Custer. Um, Allison or, or Rolls Royce has the, the the contract for the Custer's part of the engine. Um, this is a really interesting, I'm sorry, I cut my hand out like this in your picture. You can take another one if you want. I'll keep my hand out. Uh, too close to you. <laughs> <laughs> 
This is a Kellett auto gyro. And they're kind of like early helicopters. Um, this is ready to go on display. We're waiting for the epoxy to dry on the stand <laughs> to put it into the museum. And it will go over in the area where the P-12 is on the end of the early years. It's a significant addition to military history because it is the beginning of what eventually will become helicopters. Uh, and I only found out all this information two days ago, so. Uh, <laughs> helicopters actually did it from the island. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, this was flight, these were flight tested and evaluated here at Wright Field in 1931, and the first auto gyro uh, school was uh, opened here in 1938. Um, Thingabanks is different from a helicopter, the rotor has no power. Um, by going forward, it causes the rotor to spin. It's kind of like an impossibility. It stays in the air because the rotor spins, and the rotor spins because it stays in the air. <laughs> Um, they originally had wings because they thought they would need those. The later Kellett Auto Gyros did away with the wings. I kind of look like a steelman with the, with the rotor on the top. Um, the, this was restored. Pardon? They improved the rotor head. Yeah. yeah. This is um, uh, was restored for us. It was restored on the west coast, and all we had to do was put it together and touch up the cake. As I said, it's ready to go on display when the epoxy rust. missiles are a high priority for the next two years, but we who do tours over here have decided you can say everything that was interesting to say about missiles in about five minutes. <laughs> but we have a pretty complete collection of um, ICBMs. ICBMs, um, uh, continental. First one on display over in the museum is the Jupiter, which is one of the early ones. That was what Kennedy traded away to get the missiles out of Cuba, fooling both our allies and Russia because the Turks were really upset that it was going to be left unprotected, but when they didn't know and Russia didn't know that the Jupiters were retiring very shortly anyway to be replaced by something better, which they were. Um, the, what you're looking at here is a Peacekeeper and the two Titans, the Titan 1 and the Titan 2. And the Peacekeeper just, has just basically arrived here, and what you have over here is badly corroded, but that, so that's in those corners of here. They moved it. We had a second stage booster for the piece we were having before just a few days ago. Um, and I forgot actually last night to look up what the peacekeeper's role actually was and when it appears in the missile. Right? Ten more Ten more warhead, but you know what year what year we're talking about with this? 80s, okay. Because I know I meant to look that to yeah, to pull that up last night, I forgot to do it. Um, the um, two behind the first one you see here is the Titan One, and that would be our first silo-based missile. Now, the Titan One could not fire from when the missile had to be brought to the surface to go. They weren't in service terribly long and were replaced by the bigger Titan Two, which is essentially a Titan One with another stage. The Titan Two was a silo-based missile, uh, and it could launch from within the silo. Uh, if you're interested in how we move these things around, you know, around the world, and you're over in the main museum, go back to the Cold War gallery and look at the C-133. That's how we move missiles from factories to silos, was in that aircraft. And of course, the C-133 would have another cargo work as well. Um, the Titans, which are uh, probably one of the most amazing systems, Titan II will become the Gemini launch vehicle, and will be used as a launch vehicle for a number of different things. It will be replaced by the Titan III. The later models of the Titan III, the DE and F, had booster tanks. Um, much like the space shuttle, they can drop off and be recovered and be used again. The Titan IV, of which we have two left, that's it. Both of us have launched. Actually, we only have one left, because if all went well, we should have launched the one in March, and we'll launch one again in the fall. But the Titan system is, uh, is finally finished. Right. Um, the, um, but the Titan IV for many, many years has been our principal launch vehicle. As I said, we have one or two left, that's it. And then, um, oh, but I, I can't remember what the newest, we have another launch system, so that's um, the um, Delta. Delta, thank you. Yeah, the Delta is what we're currently, currently using most actually. Um, the, 
what we have to do with these is we have to, I mentioned back there, we have to make stands for them all. They all have to be on the plate crew. We also have to go, let's go down this way and see if we can see. Okay, the mark on the nose of the Titan one there. That all is stuff we have to replace because we are not allowed to have anything with radioactive content on display. And that is made of MAGFOR, which has infinitesimal radioactive content. So we have to take it out and we have to replace every single thing. It has to be the same weight. Everything about it has to be exactly the same because it has to support the same stuff uh, that it would on the real thing uh, to go on display. The Jupiter had the nose cone we had to make for that 7,000 ribbons. <laughs> Inside and out, 7,000. Uh, put that up. But we want these to look exactly correct. Um, so, and by the way, our atlas caused a bit, has caused us a problem. Um, the atlas decompressed one day outside and it has to be stored under pressure, and it tore. Well, um, right? Yeah, I know. And the thing tore, and we decided to go pick up the one that the Franklin Institute has. It was ours. But they had made an internal structure for it, so it didn't have to be under pressure. However, its parts didn't match with ours. We own the one that's in Canada, but we aren't necessarily interested in going to get that. So we've decided what we'll do with the Atlas is put it on the carrier, which we own. We could pick up the one in Philadelphia without it. Uh, to put it on the, the carrier, the parts that we have, and put it inside the C-133. <laughs> and open it up so you can see. So that's how. Stainless steel skin with a very, very thin aluminum covering over it. One, two, one, six, one over six, 6,400 6, inch, um, inch thick <laughs> aluminum. Okay, really, really paper thin. And they're gluing it on with contact cement, which of course is rubber cement. <laughs> but this is going to be quite a project, and you can see that they have to walk all over the wings. They get oh, Both these got down things together. How do you how do you get them together? These the wings hold up the, all the whole plane. Doesn't mm -hmm. look like there's anything in there. Right. This is where they restore the plane. Yeah. Looks like they gotta restore the building. Mm -hmm. First building in Philadelphia to have a sprinkler system. Now we know how to build where the buildings with computers, we know how to cheat on factors of safety. <laughs> States Air Force Museum.
the United States Air Force Museum. Put the thing at the end, whatever. Here's the uh, five from above. Sign. Oh. You didn't the sign. It's close. Signpost. Oh. That is because Paul didn't pass it to his seat belt. Uh, there we go. Sort of like the Masons. Look at all these people lurking around waiting for the <laughs> <laughs> call. Does he call in with a. Uh, you notice they never. They, 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 they never have an outback near the ocean or anything. You know, water. These guys are off the way. All right. BBU's not. That's what you were talking. Oh, oh, you want me to go and do one of my skits? Yeah. Okay. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, high above the Macadam Highway, just outside of Daytron, Ohio, attending the Outback Restaurant for molecular replenishment of our bodily fluids after a grueling day walking around the O'Hara Arena, enjoying pandemonium at its best. That's, that's, that's just what we're doing. I just don't know. Here. <laughs> Get a look. Take some shots of the waitress's bar. And she's very small girl. Mm. Well, who is? That's a video game. You can't fool me. She just nailed a guy in the shins with a ball and almost fell over. This is just a little. How do you how do you feel? feel? What? How are your feet? You're, you're being taken. My feet? Yeah. My, my feet are fine. Yeah. But my ear? Yes. It's it sore. What do you think of that suggestion oh. that I had of putting a generation H in your ear? I think it might work. <laughs> it feels like a hemorrhoid. No, it doesn't. It might cure some of the other problems there too. Brushing his teeth with the goo. No, it feels like a hemorrhoid. It feels like a hemorrhoid. Yeah. Right, it's got that. It looks like that. Tell him the seat. Tell him the seat for him to pay for the whole thing. It's got that glassy. You know that glassy feeling. You know, you know like glasses you cut your ear. Feels just like that. I gotta get some cool treatment for my ear. 